Hi, I'm Marty Otanias. Welcome to Getting High on Anthropology. This is episode 25. Today we have two guests, Ali Cloyd and Kelly Thornton. Welcome to the show. So why don't we start um, with both of you um, one at a time, uh, telling us about your um, work and um, some of the things you're doing currently in the area of hemp. Sure. Um, so currently I am helping to plan hemp educational events and um, also hemp workshops with left hand hemp. So we teach people how to build with hempcrete. So it's an all natural building material and we bring students to a site and we teach them how to build with it. So are we kind of take what you're doing. <laughs> and are the workshops open up to anyone? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, I came from a, well my background's in hydrogeology so uh, one of the things Ali will talk about is the phytoremediation capabilities of hemp something I wish we could have employed when I was doing all my work in Illinois where I don't think industrial hemp's as legal as it is here yet. Um, but I was doing um, some straw bale work, building homes with straw bale. Happened upon um, uh, some people in Colorado that were working with hemp and realized what a better media it is for construction. So Excellent. Made the switch and started doing the seminars. Okay, so just so people know, you're with Left Hand Hemp. So one more time, what is Left Hand Hemp? And then tell us about this process uh, that uh, Kelly just mentioned. So Left Hand Hemp is a company where we will teach how to build with hempcrete. So if you're looking to build a hempcrete structure on your property, we will come out and teach a class how to build with the all natural material. And the process of phytoremediation, um, so uh, hemp is really great for the soil um, because it takes up heavy metals and toxins up into its roots and then that can be disposed of um, safely without <laughs> using any, any toxic things to clean up the soil. It's all natural and really great. So um, one of the times we met, the first time, was at a hemp uh, Crete workshop. So yeah. it's great to know that you're um, doing this and doing it, um, you're scaling it up. Yeah. So um, let's have some hemp 101, because there are people that probably conflate you know, hemp, like they'll look at this um, hemp Crete brick and think you can smoke it. <laughs> so maybe <laughs> clarify for people who are new to this, um, you know, what's the relationship with hemp and cannabis and um, what could this building material be used for? Okay, so um, hemp is cannabis sativa, as well as many different forms of cannabis that are high in THC. So it's a cousin to the plant, but it was bred to not produce THC. Um, we used it from the beginning of the 13 colonies up till 1937, when they decided that cannabis was a bad thing. Um, but getting to what you can do with the hempcrete, um, so this is a mixture of lime, um, hydraulic lime and hemp and those are the only three ingredients besides water you mix it all together um, this becomes a really excellent um, material for several reasons it's a great acoustic um, media so you'll eliminate a lot of your outdoor sounds perfect if you live next to an airport everybody knows the guy that buys the house next to an airport and then complains of the noise well if you could build it out of this that would deaden the sound it's fireproof you can watch very um, numerous videos on YouTube of them trying to light this on fire because it's coated with the two powders, it renders it flame proof. Insects can't eat through it and it's an awesome temperature and um, humidity regulator. Because what you'll have is this uh, wall made out of hempcrete, plaster on both sides and eliminates the need for fiberglass insulation, drywall and latex paint. So it's pretty universal in terms of uh, for using it for building structures. So tell us through um, going through a workshop, what would be a structure that people would get their hands wet, you know, doing the hempcrete building? And then what other kinds of structures have you seen around the world that maybe integrate uh, hempcrete? Um, so what we did in the, the workshop you attended was just a small shed as kind of a demonstration. Um, at the, uh, we're gonna be doing a, um, a seminar at the Taos Pueblo in New Mexico. That's gonna be a 10 by 20 tiny house uh, for a gentleman who's a member of the Pueblo Nation. Um, and we're also gonna be doing a 16 by 20 workshop in Denver. So there's various, you know, you can use it for anything. We haven't um, scaled up to a house yet, but that's what our goal is. Um, and at all those seminars, what we do is we have the building standing and ready when the students show up or the participants. And uh, we explain a few safety rules, a few uh, instructions on how the build's gonna go and they can get their hands right in and get wet almost immediately. 
Excellent. No, I went through the one um, workshop, which was two days, and I really loved it. Um, one thing I loved about it was the food. There's food infused with hemp or made from hemp, hemp seeds. Hempsoy Foods, our so friend you wanna, Carla. Yeah, tell us a little about that, because I think besides this, hempcrete, there's other products that you can um, make using hemp and hemp seeds. Oh my goodness, there's like, what, 50,000 uses yeah. for the plant? Um, but hemp food is one of the, the best, because it's really nutritious. It has omega-3, 6, and 9s. Um, magnesium, iron, more protein than an ounce of salmon. Uh, Hempway Foods is a, a really awesome company. They've got hemp burgers and hemp crumbles, chili. And she's in Alfalfa's actually in um, Boulder and Louisville. So you guys should try it. And uh, yeah, and there's a lot of other things you can use it for too. Hemp plastic is amazing. Um, uh, BMW just came out with a car, the i3, and it's super lightweight and um, electric, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it the i8 as well. Yeah. Mm. The more expensive electric. And that's what Henry Ford actually made his first car out of. Excellent. Well, yeah. And the other thing is, um, backing up a bit, tell us about, <coughs> maybe with you, Ali, um, how did you end up getting into either hemp or cannabis-related work? Like, at what moment did you cross the line and think about that this was a profession for you? Um, I think um, right when I graduated college, I learned about hemp through a different nonprofit. And they were trying to do a program down in, um, where was it? Uh, not Haiti. Uh, I forget right now. <laughs> and they wanted the village to grow hemp so that they could, um, you know, be sustainable. And so I just, I dove right into it and learned all about it. And I was like, hemp can do all of these things. Why is it illegal? Why aren't we using it? And so I just started volunteering with the Rocky Mountain Hemp Association, which is now the National Hemp Association. And um, I've just been in the industry ever since because I think it's great and it's taking off and there's some really amazing people in it. So That's great. We're um, in a good state in terms yes. of Colorado being supportive. Um, how about with you? What At what moment in your life did you say, you know, I'm going to cross this line and get into this, invest time and money and, um, and, en and energy? Um, well, they, um, so when I was a kid, I always wondered why I would see hemp. I would hear hemp. I'd hear the word hemp and I'm like, okay. They used to, everybody knows rope, right? So, and little side note is like in 37, after they passed the Marijuana Tax Act, they came back in 1941 and said, hey, we need hemp for, you know, World War II, we need it for the riggings on the ship. Because at the time, I believe the uh, DuPonts couldn't keep up with the demand and hemp rope was really great. Um, so it always had it in the background. Um, it wasn't until I moved to Colorado for a job and uh, my roommate was a medical cannabis patient and I'd never even tried cannabis up to that point. <laughs> 39 years old, right? So um, once we went to actually a 420 event, it was like the second 420 event, the gentleman was handing out hemp. And I took it, grew it, um, was amazed at, at how quickly it grew, how big the stalks were, uh, how prolific the volunteers were. The next year I planted 10 plants, got about 48,000 seeds off those 10 plants. And then the next year we had like 250 plants. After that I lost count. But as I started studying more and more about all of the uses for hemp, from biofuels to building materials to clothes to food, I was just like, no wonder this plant's been illegal for 80 years because it can do anything. I often refer to it now as the tree of life. Mm -hmm. Like the cannabis plant is the tree of life. That's, that's great. That's my take. So maybe for those who are like sitting at home watching this and they're interested in um, a workshop, mm -hmm. so take us through what would be the things that they would go through, like systematically, um, how would people spend the time and would they come out with some basic proficiency or like what would be the ultimate goal in terms of developing a skill set or gen general interest among participants? Go ahead. Okay, so um, going through the straw bale workshops that I had attended, um, my mentor, uh, Andrew Morris, and if I can throw his name out there, uh, is an awesome teacher. He made them fun. He made them so fun that when people signed up, they would just throw their money <laughs> at him. And, and they're literally week-long seminars. Uh, you get right into the building after about a half a day of instruction. And it's such a great atmosphere. You know, you've got three meals a day that are provided. You've usually got a place to camp. We, we like to do it in a little bit of a rural setting, if we can, um, as long as people have a place to stay. Um, you've got like-minded individuals who are showing up because they either want to know uh, just for fun, they want to take part in a seminar and do something sustainable. They want to build a sustainable house. A lot of this guy's straw bale customers are repeat people who were students in his class then turn around and host a seminar. 
Uh, but I was just amazed at, at how fun they were. It's like the funnest week I think you can imagine when you're actually doing work <laughs> and paying to do work. So, uh, but you do, you leave with the, uh, the now, now with the hemp grade seminars, we're trying to kind of, you know, mimic that a little bit, have three great meals a day with as much hemp infused food as we can have. Um, have fun while you're doing it. You know, people can participate as little or as much as they want. Um, there's really no pressure and it's a fun time for everybody that attends. So it's just a good atmosphere. Plus you're doing something beneficial. I mean, you're, I'd love to see conventional construction change to more sustainable methods than what we have now. Yeah, no, they, I think that sounds like a, a reasonable goal. Mm -hmm. um, so with you, Ali, mm -hmm. so tell me about your um, hemp work in terms of advocacy. Mm -hmm. There's this hemp tour. Mm -hmm. So what is the hemp tour and what's the status of it today? So the Hemp Road Trip is a, um, um, an organization that goes on the road to teach people about hemp. So they've stopped at Oh, I think like 40 states now, um, 20 different universities, and they've talked to legislators all over the country as well. And they are just on a mission to talk about hemp and to teach people about hemp, um, show products, talk about companies, opportunities. Um, and I was with them in the fall, and we went to some universities and talked to a lot of agronomy students and um, just sustainability-minded um, students, and they were so excited about hemp, about the opportunities that hemp has, um, you know, about how it can really help the, the soil and give farmers another chance to, to grow something different, too. That's great. Yeah. And so today, is there a goal to um, uh, generate legislative change, or is there, mm -hmm. like, what's the ultimate goal with the... Um, to promote federal full hemp legislation, full plant legislation. Um, so there's a um, bill that just got introduced to Congress. It's the Industrial Hemp Farming Act of 2017. Um, it's an amendment to the, to the first one that was passed in 2014. And it is to propose um, hemp being legal on the federal level. And are you hopeful? And if so, what's the source of the hope to get that passed? Yes. Um, all the associations and the lobbyists and the advocates involved are very hopeful. Um, it is really a bipartisan issue, and you know they talk about creating jobs. This will create tons. So excellent. So some people may be wondering, in the current climate with the Trump administration, do you think there'll be any kind of backpedaling, or people maybe who were supportive before now not supportive, or is that kind of a non-issue for you? Well, I can just speak from personal experience in that I used to talk about hemp many years ago. I mean, not many years ago, like five years ago. And people thought I was talking about marijuana. Mm -hmm. And today, people totally know that I'm talking about industrial hemp. And they get the benefits. They, they understand the economic value of it. And they, we've done a really good job of, of talking to our legislators and, and you know educating people on it. So I think they to say, oh, well, you can't tell between a marijuana field and a hemp field is just bogus. It doesn't have any leg to stand on now. So, Excellent. So um, we're going to take a little break. Um, so stay tuned. We'll be right back with a little more discussion with um, Allie Cloyd and Kelly Thornton. Ehlers Stanlow syndrome is, is a rare yeah, genetic yeah, connective definitely. tissue disorder that affects collagen joints and skin. It's been, it's People with EDS have okay. frequent yeah. dislocations and hyperextensions. Cool. The audio is when I was 16, a genetic specialist belt. diagnosed like, me with this condition, I know, I, I, but I always knew something was not quite right with my body. I felt unstable and wobbly, and people okay. would make comments about the appearance of my joints. Oh, I tell my them arms and legs are not straight up and down. Instead, they are extra oh, hyperextended. Oh, okay. I can do things with my so, body okay. that so most what, people are unable to do. Well, I, I, one I'm time, only my looking dance for teacher, that one that one. being okay, amazed I'll, I'll at how to, um, arched and pointy my feet were, we told me at? that I should consider oh, being a ballerina. Yeah. Later that year, my I mom and I were in a cooking class. I was 11. Has, I twisted okay around to ask her a question and my knee shot shots. clean out of my socket. So, I yes, dropped so to the I floor in agony. Within minutes, my knee swelled yeah, up to the size of a oh, cantaloupe. See, the red, the red At the ER, the, red the, red the red doctor red pulled red out a needle longer than my hand. He said he was going to aspirate my knee by sticking the needle between my kneecap and my socket. If the liquid from my knee came out clear or yellow, that was a good sign. If it came out red, that was bad. A Merlot-colored liquid filled the syringe and my heart dropped. 
Um, it'll Later, look, a surgeon watch, informed like me that if I ever wanted to have a normal life, I needed tendon replacements so, in both knees. My mom believed Thanks, that at such it. a young age, um, so any intensive surgery was out of the question. She pulled me out of physical activities during and after school. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. While kids were playing kickball or chasing each other around, my time in middle school was spent in knee braces and physical therapy. High school wasn't any better. I felt like the girl in the plastic bubble. Okay, so Depressed, unhealthy, and too terrified to do anything. Even though I was cautious at all times with well, what I did with, with my body, the dislocations uh, of my shoulders, yeah, ribs, ankles, we elbows, and wrists kept happening. Pain medication didn't work because I'm severely allergic to most opiate drugs. Then cannabis found me. She was recommended to me by a friend who saw me struggling to manage my pain. I was at my friend's birthday party, and she noticed that while everyone else was having fun, I was sitting alone, ruminating in my own agony. Her dad loaded up a bong and insisted I take a hit. Almost it's, instantly, um, okay my pain dulled. It purposes. would not be an exaggeration yeah. for um, me to say that cannabis live, is life-changing. My um, pain is at a level it, that I can tolerate, um, and yeah, there is a sense of normalcy purposes, in my body. Totally well, well, my surgeon had to sit down with my mom there. and convinced her to allow me to use cannabis as medicine. With my med card in hand, I purchased edibles and extracts containing CBD, the non-psychoactive version of cannabis. The number of dislocations have gone down because of the buildup of my muscles. When Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome or some other health problem with severe pain ruins your day, choose cannabis. Uh, welcome back to Getting High on Anthropology. My name is Marty Otanias. I'm the host and uh, producer of the show. Uh, today we have Allie Cloyd and Kelly Thornton with uh, Left Hand Hemp. So Left Hand Hemp is doing some really exciting things with some uh, Native Americans. So you want to expand on what you're doing and give us a couple details? Sure. Um, we had a lot of uh, interaction. We had a booth at NOCO this year up in uh, Loveland. So uh, people don't know what NOCO okay. is. Okay, NOCO stands for the Northern Colorado Hemp Expo. Um, this is the fourth year for it. It was a uh, pretty good turnout. Uh, and this year we were fortunate enough to have a booth there. And through that booth, we met two different groups of people. One was um, the Wuminiti um, Earth... Native Sanctuary. Native Sanctuary, right. Sorry about that. It's a long name. Um, but they are uh, members of the Taos Pueblo Nation. Um, and they want us to help, as I mentioned earlier, a 10 by 20 tiny house. Um, and then we also met a couple from the Fort Berthoud re uh, Reservation where hemp's not as widely accepted. It's North Dakota. It's a little bit different than, than New Mexico. Um, and in both cases, what we're doing is working with these two groups of people to educate the tribal uh, councils as to the benefits of growing hemp. And we're finding they're a little hesitant because of, uh, you know, the, the native reservation links to the federal government. Mm. So if there's any subsidies, much like farmers faced when they first started growing, if they were getting federal subsidies for growing a particular crop, they were in fear that if they grew hemp, which wasn't technically legal at a federal level, that they would lose their federal subsidies, which is a huge part of their uh, income. So with the Taos Pueblo, for example, we're, um, we've met with the tribal council once. They've invited us to come back down and talk to the war chief, who's the, the top guy in the tribal council, um, about the benefits of growing hemp. And in the meantime, we're going to educate um, through the seminar, how to build with hempcrete is just one of the many functions. Uh, the um, the group we're working with actually produces hemp food right now. It's a protein bar uh, that you can actually get in Boulder. I mean, they're trying to reach out and get some stuff. Um, and it's an excellent bar, texture of a Tootsie Roll, great taste. Um, anyway, um, with the Fort Berthold Reservation, they came and visited our property and saw the shed that we built last summer, and they went two of those in two different spots to do um, two different seminars, which is going to be excellent. And um, what we offer is we want to take in, you know, customers from outside of the reservation who are going to be paying, but we're also extending um, some scholarships to up to, you know, 10 to 15 people off the reservation, you know, the teach a man to fish adage, mm -hmm. right? So if we can teach them to build with this, they can essentially grow their own houses right on the reservation and make themselves that much more sustainable and that less uh, dependent on any sort of Bureau of Indian Affairs type of organization. That's excellent. It sounds, sounds great. And it'd be nice to you know even capture that through footage and share with the viewers. So talk to me if I'm a member of the Tribal Council. What would you say to convince me if um, I'm kind of fence-sitting? So how would you pitch the project to ensure the Tribal Council doesn't create any obstacles? Um, well, the first thing you have to do is, of course, do the separation of, of 
what's considered marijuana and what's considered industrial hemp because for example what they've been talking to Allie and I about is up there it's all marijuana it, it doesn't matter it looks like marijuana it smells like marijuana in some cases so it must be marijuana um, so we have to educate them the differences of industrial hemp versus uh, regular cannabis um, and secondly you do a hempcrete demonstration and they're all amazed because <laughs> we did one and um, after we all did our talks I had them all come over, put on the neoprene gloves. I'm like, all right, guys, it's time to get your hands dirty. We mixed up the hemp right in front of them. They all helped mix it. We formed a, you know, a nice Tupperware-sized brick, uh, and that was it. And so they were, I think they were hooked right then to see the, you know, the ability to build with this material. That's great, and I felt that magic. I mean, taking the hempcrete workshop, you know, putting your hands in it, feeling it, and just, um, you know, getting away from other kinds of synthetic materials and working with stuff that comes right, you know, from, from the earth. So yeah. I really hope there's um, some success in a couple of months that we hear about these workshops. Um, what other kinds of events or upcoming activities do, uh, do you have with Left Hand Hemp? So we have the June 12th through the 18th. We're going to be in Taos, New Mexico. And then Ju July 1st through the 7th, we're going to be in Denver, Colorado. And then when are we doing Fruit Bertold? August? Uh, we have a meeting with them uh, in early June. June to meet with their council. And then uh, we were shooting for August, September date to try to get some of those knocked out. Yep. So um, you could go to our website, learnhempcrete.com, and find all the information for all of our workshops there. Excellent. So I'm glad you mentioned the website because it seems like social media is a tool and a resource that you use. Yes. So tell me a little bit more. What are the What's a regular work routine for you when you sit down and try to disseminate this stuff or use it for educational networking purposes? So give me a little background because I know you have a, a little bit of expertise in social media. Yeah. Um, we really just like to document um, everything that we're doing and, and keep people engaged because it, it this is an education um, you know piece to everything that we're doing is is trying to educate people on all the benefits of hemp um, you know the supply chain the market and uh, how it can help the economy and the environment so with that in mind we you know post pictures we go to events we talk to people and um, do these workshops and, and teach people about it all right and I'm glad you mentioned the supply chain because I think some people when they look at Colorado or they know about um, Colorado as a weed state, mm -hmm. um, not much emphasis or knowledge about um, hemp in general. And so can you guys provide some details about the current market of industrial hemp in the state or any kind of um, details just to give people about what the setting is like? Like, is it a small sector? Is it large? Is it growing? Are there some hurdles that you want to see overcome? Um, processing is the caveat to all of the hemp growing. There's tons of farmers that have grown who have bales of hemp because they've grown it, they've baled it, and then now what? Mm -hmm. um, so processing is a huge step. Um, there's a couple places that have talked about it. You know, the the term, the key term is decortication, and that's where you take the stalk, you put it through a machine, it separates the skin, which is the hemp fiber, from the herd, which is basically the wood chip that you get when you're done. And and the funny thing is, if you went out with a bag, a 33 pound bag of wood chips from hemp stock, nobody would know if it was hemp or oak, or well, I mean, probably not oak, but you know what I mean? It looks like wood. Um, and then the fiber, of course, is what goes off for paper, uh, clothing, and a, a myriad of other things that you can make with hemp fiber. Um, and then this can be used for hempcrete, animal bedding. Uh, if you break it down small enough, I've seen demonstrations of it being very oil absorbent, and so you can use it as sort of an, an oil absorbent type material. Excellent. Clean up all that fracking mess. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. That so the supply chain right now, like right now we're looking for hemp herd for our seminars. Um, we don't have a decorticator yet. Uh, left hand hemp is also, as opposed to being uh, simply, a, right now we're focusing on the hempcrete, but at some point in time we'd like to be a large scale farm mm. <laughs> to supply our own hemp herd so we don't have to source it from somewhere else. But um, once the products get made into marketable, saleable items, I mean it's just going to be the floodgates are going to open. Okay, so I'm glad you're mentioning um, the level of detail that you are. So, so one more time, we have a hemp plant, mm -hmm. and then um, tell us about what needs to be done to get something inside that hemp plant, and then to make this guy right here. Oh, what do you mean get something inside? So it's not like the leaves and stems, everything's are put right. in a shredder, and then you come up with all this stuff. Right, right. So what what component parts of the hemp plant are um, used to produce hempcrete? Okay, so there's 
like cannabis, there's several different strains of hemp. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with, um, you know, Manitoba Harvest is the huge one that we import for food. Um, and they grow for seed and they grow for big seeds. So when you go to, to harvest, you know, you get those hemp hearts, which are the omega rich uh, nutrients that she mentioned earlier. Um, so what we do is industrial hemp. What you want to do is if you can get CBD out of your, your crop, um, they'll take the flowers and the buds off first. Mm -hmm. And ideally you would have a machine that would be able to harvest those buds and leave the stalk. And then the stalk is later run through some sort of redding or decortication process to separate the two main components, which are the fiber and the herd. Um, so yeah, you don't want to just shove the, the whole plant in. You want to get your seed and or bud off first. All and the then you're left with the stock, yeah, all the leaves and stuff okay. like that. So, um, but there's a like we were going to do. I mean, you can do with just the industrial grade hemp. You can make food grade oil. So it's just oil that you would eat with the omegas. It's not CBD. It's not anything. Matter of fact, the hemp we grew last year had <laughs> almost no CBD in it at all. But you could still crush the seed into oil. You can put it in soaps. You can put it in lotions. You can eat it. Uh, you can use it as just a lotion by itself. It's got nice quality. Uh, to it. It's a little bit greasy, but still um, softens the hands. Some people are growing for fiber. If they want to be a paper, um, you know, raw material supplier or clothing. I, my, I think that nobody in Colorado has fiber good enough for textiles just yet. Mm -hmm. But eventually, hopefully that'll go by the wayside as well. But there's so many products. We were just having a conversation last night at a hemp event that you can make out of hemp. I don't ever see this market doing anything but being profitable. I mean, any plant that you can take and make thousands of things into, like as opposed to corn. You've got corn, all the byproducts they make it into because they it's subsidized, so hey, why not? Uh, and ethanol. So you can even make biofuels with hemp, just like you can corn. It's easier to grow. It's better for the environment. I mean, there's really no argument between the two. It's hemp all the way. So. Right. No, it's excellent. So both of you are sort of... Um, early adopters, risk takers. So is there anything about um, left hand hemp that, um, and we have about two minutes to wrap up, anything that keeps you up at night <laughs> about the work that you're doing? Uh, not, not, not really the, the work that we're doing, just um, you know the current state of, I guess, the environment and, and the world a little bit. Um, but we know that this is a, a great solution, so that helps us sleep. Excellent, <laughs> how about you, Kelly? Um, you know, just the organization, I'd almost compare it to a flight. I mean, you take off, you get, you get up in the air, you're going, you might hit some turbulence before you're able to come back down and land. So what we want to do is make each seminar as successful as we can, as fun as we can, and as educational for the participants as we can. And uh, all the while, hope that the conventional market switches to more sustainable means. Excellent. Well, I really enjoyed learning about hemp from you guys, and I hope um, we can have you on uh, the show in the future and especially learn about some of your upcoming workshops after they're done to tell people what went on and the future goals. So um, if people want to get a hold of you one more time, the website and um, any other additional information you want to add. Good. So we're on Facebook, Left Hand Hemp, uh, and we got the name because we started our business right on Left Hand Creek is why, and, uh, and of course it's named after Chief Niwat. It's a great story. Um, and then we're on learnhempcrete.com is the website. And I think... Um, and our email? Oh, lefthandhemp at gmail.com. We don't have a Twitter yet, I think. We've got so many Twitters, I don't want to add another one. Anyway. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. Um, I want to thank you for tuning in today. I'm Marty Otanias with Getting High on Anthropology. We'll see you next time.